great. Um, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, okay. Let's change this. So, um, can everybody hear and see okay? You can just thumbs up. <laughs> My name is Kirsten Wilson and I work at Hospital Field. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this in conversation. Um, this in conversation is um, part of um, an exhibition that Kirsty McCune um, has made for Hospital Field as part of her free drawing school residency. And also um, alongside that, she's showing her own work that she made in the residency alongside um, work from the Arbroath Correspondence School. Um, but today we're going to be really um, having a, an informal in conversation, just talking about postal projects and mail art. Um, and the people speaking today are Kirsty McEwen, as I mentioned, who is an artist based in Dundee and our Free Drawing School Artists in Residence for 2020-21. Um, and Amanda Lynch, who is an artist and also of the Correspondence Collective. And Priscilla Caton, who is curator of the Outcome um, Exhibition for South Bank's project, Art by Post. So welcome everybody. Um, that's who we're, is going to be speaking today. I'm going to take a back seat and just do the admin and everything. There will be an opportunity for questions. So if people know how to use the chat function, there's a little box at the bottom saying chat. If you think of a question as people are speaking, you can type up that question and just put Q&A before you ask that question. And that will draw my eye towards it and I'll try and pull all those together for the end. There's also an opportunity for you to ask questions via video, if you would like to use video and ask the questions directly. So, um, I'm also going to be sharing my screen at some point with some images, so they should come up. Um, if there's any issues or anything, for some reason you can't see it, just pop that in the chat as well and I'll keep an eye on it. Um, I think you're all automatically muted. Um, that's really great. Thanks, just to avoid interference with the um, whoever's speaking. If you can remain muted, that's perfect. And um, it's also been recorded today, so um, that's just so we can share the video and the talk with those that couldn't make it and that really wanted to join today as well. So if um, you have a problem with, we'll um, just keep your video off if you don't want to be recorded or when you're speaking or anything. Okay, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Kirsty. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Kirsty, and I, uh, as Kirsten said, was the free drawing school artist um, for last year, the past, well, just beyond the past 12 months now. Um, I'm just looking through some of the names of the guests here. It's quite nice to put some faces and see that some of our participants are all here joining us. It's uh, nice to finally see you in person. Uh, I'm going to do a very quick kind of introduction to the project and then we'll go on to Amanda and Priscilla. And as I say, we'll get into a nice conversation. So I think Kirsten's got some images to share um, from little sort of snippets of the uh, Correspondent school, so they'll just come up. Um, so yeah, so I had a free drawing school residency, um, started, well, delayed from March 2020 and finally got started in August uh, 2020 in our broth. Um, at the time, there were still some quite tight sort of lockdown or sort of uh, restrictions, not so much lockdown, but just restrictions in place. So we were kind of limited in terms of workshops that we could do, which was quite difficult for a publicly uh, publicly engaged residency but we kind of we got there we sort of planned lots of things with schools we got some workshops with limited numbers running at hospital field and then uh, lockdown 2.0 happened uh, in January so it felt like all of the kind of time and effort and the hard work had just been kind of stopped and shut down just like click your fingers it all had to end again so I, still being on residency, had to come up with a, a plan uh, of how to remain making these kind of publicly engaged works um, without actually meeting anyone in person. I knew quite early on when I had to do this plan that I did not want to do it via Zoom anymore. Um, I had done things for Hospital Field in the past for Zoom. They were quite successful. It was good. Um, but Zoom was a huge part of my my day job, so I'm an, an art and design lecturer um, at a college, and I was Zoomed out 24 seven, coupled that with family Zooms, Zoom quiz nights, meeting your pals, birthdays on Zoom. I just couldn't do it anymore. So I thought, right, 
how we go do this analog I think so I'm a big fan of analog I don't do much digital uh, work and kind of I'd always wanted to do a mail art project anyway but it had always been kind of a sort of back burner um, away from um, uh, like sort of sidelined against other kind of projects I was working on I thought this is the, the perfect opportunity um, to get this off the ground now so with Hospital Fields Help, we did an open call. Um, I was hoping I would maybe get about 20 participants. I thought that would be very nice and manageable, 20 people or so. And I think over the first 40 hours, we got 40 participants. And in a week, we had 100. And then we had to cap the list there. And then we still, I think overall, had 150 signups or just thereabouts. But we had to stick to 100 because um, it was just me on my own writing these envelopes. Um, I sort of posted things out. So every week or so, I would compile a little pack or a pack of kind of prompts, whether that be collage or a postcard or some other kind of gesture um, to, to send out to people, usually based around our growth or the sort of pandemic we were going through um, and sort of encourage people to respond. So the one on the screen that you can see that I probably should talk about was the first one that I sent out um, it was a straight up just photocopy of my hand. We had this great old photocopier uh, brought to hospital field um, and I just caught, photocopied my hand a hundred times and I thought if I can't be there with people in, per in person, I'm going to just send this kind of handshake across the void to wherever you are um, and I sent these out. And I didn't think much more about it. I thought, okay, people will respond to this. Um, but actually, the amount of kind of responses I got to that, and I got a lot of really quite touching letters, and uh, real people really kind of appreciated that gesture, which I hadn't really anticipated. Um, it was quite moving, uh, getting those back. So that was the kind of first one, and that really kind of spurred me on. Um, I think we can go to the next slide, Kirsten. I don't want to, to waffle on here. This one always amused me, so I used to have to set up a little, I guess it was a little production line, um, as I say, just me, I would go in on a Friday, uh, did all my photocopying and I laid it all out. And this this was this kind of accidental amusement to me. I would laid them out like that so that the stamps could dry. There was like an inky thing on the corner. Um, and this, yeah, I don't know, just like this, like Mr. Tickle's arms or something. Uh, very amusing. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so as I was sending out all my prompts and collage packs and various things via post, the, the amazing thing to me about mail art is that mail artists are kind of fanatical about mail art and one sort of dedicated mail artist get wind of your project they send you all this cool stuff sort of unsolicited and they, they seek out your address and they just send you loads of cool stuff in the post and something that I always enjoyed was the envelopes so there's just a couple here but sometimes the envelopes were just as inventive as as the the kind of contents in there um, and yeah, just a little slice. That was kind of a magical thing to come in on a Friday to this pile of new stuff. It was brilliant. I'd sit and open it all up and, and get all involved. So the next slide. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, this is jumping forward a bit. So I've been doing this for a little while. And at this point, talking of mail art communities, getting wind of each other's projects, Amanda got in touch with me. Amanda had been organising the uh, Correspondence Collective and she asked if I would like to collaborate and we devised this mail art chain. Um, and what we did is we invited participants from our respective projects and we each sent a piece of work in the post to make stops on the way to the other end. So I sent this A1 piece of work south towards Amanda down in London and Amanda sent a piece of work north towards our broth, making off all these, these kind of making various stops on the way down, everyone responding to the next uh, or the last piece of work. That arrived um, and then this eventually arrived back in our growth and this when I opened it um, I don't know what I was expecting but it was it blew my mind when I opened these these pieces of work uh, it was just such a joyful thing to see everyone's contributions and the inventiveness and I don't know how well you can see on the bottom here but that's a little crochet we think it's crochet not knitting so it's crocheted on becomes this kind of beautiful wall hanging almost um, like a like a rug for the wall or something a uh, beautiful thing. And you can skip on again. Next slide. Last slide. So the last kind of mail out I did, um, as I said, I was trying to keep them all 
kind of based around our growth, um, our, both, our growth history. So it transpired that the inventor of the self-adhesive postage stamp was actually born in our growth. Um, in, I think it was 1874, something like that. He invented the self-adhesive postage stamp. So I thought we'll do a little homage to James Chalmers. This is him here. Um, and what I did was I got these, these portraits printed and sent out essentially a collage pack, uh, sent them out all over the world um, and invited people to respond to this portrait. Um, I have actually turned these into an edition of postage stamps, but in somewhat predictable, predictable fashion they haven't arrived because they're in the post somewhere had to get them from Germany so they're they're kind of on their way but I'm looking forward to receiving these um and that was the kind of uh the last finale I suppose of the the uh our both correspondence school um I do intend to keep it going I'm going to keep it going as Dundee correspondence school um I'll be doing a mail out soon um but yeah that's my my very brief overview I hope that was okay Kirsty Thumbs up. Cool. Um, I'll pass that on to Amanda, who wants to do a little intro. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to add in a little massive thank you to Kirsty and Kirsten to uh, inviting me to take part in this course. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, if I, uh, when you can, can I have my images, please? Um, so, hi, I'm Amanda Lynch. I'm the founder of the Correspondence Collective. So we established in 20, end of 2020. And um, I was really lucky to put on an exhibition titled Restriction at Clay Hill Arts in Somerset. Um, I'm originally based in Somerset, uh, but I'm currently in London at the moment. So the Correspondence Collective um, was looking at the theme of restriction. The um, exhibition was in March 2021. So uh, yeah, another lockdown. So this was going to be an in-person um, exhibition, but because of uh, COVID-19 hit when we were planning, we had to radically rethink <laughs> about what we were going to do. Um, so the, here in this image, you can see uh, Deborah Parks with her mask on, and I was working entirely remotely because of the COVID circumstances. There's my little face on the screen. <laughs> um, so in front of you here is the letterpress unit that was used to exhibit all of the work. And the reason that we picked uh, what could be overlooked as a piece of furniture was that each um, part of each tray had a different size compartment. And obviously we were really looking at restriction as a theme and obviously all uh, experiencing lockdown at the time. So I just thought it was really fitting uh, to allocate each artist five different compartments for this project. Um, there was over 200 artists from across the globe. They'd done various mixture of artworks, which was amazing from artist books to miniature sculptures, the smallest compartment being the same size as a postage stamp. The biggest being um, same size as a mobile phone, like standard sort of Android size uh, today. And um, there was also some jigsaw pieces that were allocated across different drawers, which was really interesting. And the reason people had different spaces and different drawers was to get a good collective of each tray. So each tray became its own collective as part of the project. So in each tray, there's 25 to 30 artists per tray. Um, and in total, there was over a thousand artworks, which was an insane thing to send through the post. So I said, I was working remotely, um, Deborah Parks at Clayhill. Um, what we did was um, I had done my open call and we allocate, I allocated the spaces and all the work was sent by the postal system to Clayhill Arts and Debbie are then allocated uh, people's work into the spaces. Um, can I get the next slide, please? So this is just um, a front on view of the letterpress. So it was just Debbie's piece of furniture that she had, and I was jumped on it for um, a piece of uh, the space to exhibit in. Um, if we could get the next slide, please. And it's just side view. So as you can see, there's 10 different trays. Um, and each one was filled. I had a, I was overwhelmed by the response. It was absolutely amazing experience um, to, to be doing this project, especially in a time when people needed to be part of something. And again, it was a uh, used in mail art as more of a theme and a thread for this project. And I became interested in mail art because of Deborah um, at Clayhill. So we had that sort of fundamental start from the beginning, which was really lovely. Um, can I get the next slide, please? And this is just a close-up view of um, 
you know, some of the work. So as you can see, it's jam packs. There's lots of different things from portraits of masks to little sculptures within this work. And I'm um, just picking up on mail art and how that sort of came into this. Because I'd been interested from mail art from Deborah um, looking at mail art in the 60s and how that had been quite radical um, and how you could do like DIY movements really quickly, like Kirsty did with her photocopying of her hand. How can you make work quick and get it out to the masses? Uh, that was something I was really interested in and um, sending work through the post. Well, why not? Which was that, that was our sort of thinking for the project. Um, and I got in touch with Kirsty because I found her on Instagram. I know she hates social media, but I did find her. <laughs> um, and yeah, we just set up a mail art chain. And I can see today from you lovely participants that we have got some of you who have joined us from the collective who also took part in that project. So hi to everyone who, who is here and thanks for joining. Um, yeah, and if you've got another slide. And this is just, uh, this is the last one. This is just a little close up of, as you can see, they're really, really tiny work. Um, from those little map houses are that's the same size as a postage stamp so it's coming out it's a uh, two and a half centimeters by three deep so yeah it's a little 3d sculpture but it's really really little so I just wanted to show you that one try and get some scale in there for you um, yeah so that that's a little roundup for me and I'll hand over now to Priscilla um, Catty Hi everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Priscilla. Um, great to, to see you all today and thank you to Kirsty and Kirsten and Amanda for this, this lovely invitation. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the um, South Bank Centre in London. Their initiative um, in response to COVID was to launch the Art by Post project. Um, they had already been doing a lot of activities around increasing um, access to the arts for people with um, that were at risk of social isolation and, and digital exclusion and trying to um, increase well-being through through artistic projects. And then obviously when COVID happened, they thought a lot about <clears throat> what what they could do in order to keep these activities going and they knew they wanted to do something. Um, that used the post that wasn't online as well. And so they launched um, this idea of Art by Post. Um, and similarly to uh, Kirsty's project, I think they had initially hoped that about 300 people would sign up and overnight they reached that. So they, um, in the end, uh, I think they had 4,500 people sign up to the project and they, um, they create, created activity booklets and they invited um, artists and musicians and writers from across the whole South Bank's artistic program to create these booklets. So in the end, they they commissioned twelve activity booklets that, and each booklet was sent out one per month, and each booklet had a couple of like four or five different activities in them, and activities that you could do in your own home with limited access to materials. Really like quite straightforward things like looking out your window and. Um, imagining yourself as a tree and writing a poem about it or picking a song that would ignite your internal fire and dance around to it and then write about it. So um, yeah, asking people to do things maybe they haven't tried before and trying to incite some new inspiration. Um, and then with each booklet that was sent out, there was always included a free post envelope and an invitation to send back what you had made. Um, with this conversation around having an outcome exhibition. <clears throat> and so they launched this project in May of 2020. And then in um, March of 2021 is when they hired me to help them um, visualize what this outcome exhibition would be. So um, Kirsten, if you don't mind uh, sharing an image, then I can show you. So I had about six months to go through <clears throat> um, the 600 submissions that were returned in the free post envelopes um, and, and conceive of the exhibition and have it fabricated. And, and then we launched it in September, so just recently. And now the exhibition is on tour. So it was at South Bank Centre um, for two weeks and now it's going to five different venues across the UK. Um, yeah, it was a really, it was really challenging and exciting to go through all of the submissions and try to make sense of it, try to make sure that all of the participants felt really celebrated and honored, but also thinking about new audiences to the project and how um, people who don't know about it, how when they encountered the exhibition, how we could interest them in it as well. So it, it meant, for me, it was very important that it was bright and colorful 
And also because it's meant to sort of encapsulate this lockdown period, I also was really aware of people coming to it um, with this sort of traumatic experience that we've all had over this past year and, and wanting, wanting it to be, um, yeah, celebratory and not so triggering for a lot of people. <clears throat> um, and so I invited quite a few artists to um, work with me um, to commission new works, to filter and reorganize some of the, of the artworks that the um, participants had sent in because this space that you can see now is in the center of the South Bank, which is great. It's an amazingly accessible um, central hub, but it also didn't have any walls in it. So it was quite challenging to think about how to present all of these um, 600 submissions that were essentially small A4 pieces of paper. Um, so you can see on the blue wall, a little bit to the right, is a selection of framed artworks. And those were um, the only original artworks that we were able to show because it was the one wall that we were able to have. Um, but we created a publication, which is at the end of that wall that um, included more of the participants' artwork. Um, and I think if you go to the next slide, yeah, so this, um, this central space within the exhibition um, hosted an activity where we invited people to um, sit and within the exhibition and um, respond to one of the activities that was in one of the original booklets around cultivating hope. And Bernadette Russell was the artist that, that designed this and she um, asked people to invite them to write a letter to a stranger or draw their self portrait so people could sit within the exhibition and engage with some of the activities and then these postcards that they made, whether they wrote a letter or, or just a note or drew their own picture was posted into a post box in the exhibition space. And all of these postcards will be sent to people that were unable to physically come to the exhibition. And I think um, that was a really important part of the project to me is that unlike um, Amanda and Kirsty's projects were very much about the, the format of a male art project and this project uses post and uses it as a way to interact with audiences and and sort of broaden audiences that can't, couldn't physically come so a lot of people in um, prisons were collaborating as part of the project and in care homes and so it, it reached a lot of um, people that wouldn't normally be able to come to a gallery um, yeah, there was um, about 66% of the people participating were living alone and 88% of them um, lived with one or more long-term health concerns. Um, so I'll just really quickly whip through the rest of the exhibition, but you can see, um, yeah, selection of the individual's works as I was going through it and looking at the original booklets that were commissioned there were three key themes that came out of, of all of the artwork. Um, and the, the themes were, were hope and nature, and then around um, sound and movement. So including song and dance and physical activity. Um, so it really was quite clear that these were like the main key elements that, um, that we all kind of were drawn to and used this past year. So that was very much highlighted throughout the work. And um, if you go to the next slide, you can see, yeah. So there was one large tapestry per theme as well. This is the Hope theme tapestry, which is a, an, an arrangement of a lot of self-portraits that people made in response to the, the booklet that I already um, mentioned that was around hope, um, as well as self-portraits. Some people drew hearts and listed all of the things that they really love or that are really important to them. So it is in its essence sort of a self-portrait as well. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it felt really important to sort of visualize the community that formed around this project as well. Um, with every booklet that was sent out, there was always a Zoom session or um, a telephone conference session around each booklet where they the group um, of participants were invited to meet the artists and do another activity. And, and in these moments, they were able to meet each other as well. And really, um, yeah, there was sort of friendships and, and share, sharing works that <clears throat> sort of came out of these sessions as well. So this sort of, um, this way of collectively bringing together everyone and showing their faces was very important of, of sort of stating like, um, 
because often isolation and loneliness is so invisible and in a way of making people's presence known, but also collectively together. Um, and then the next slide should be, yeah, so this is the tapestry around nature. Um, and one of the participants um, is called Luke Squire and he, he found the project through um, Flying Fish Artists, which is a, um, a, a, a therapy group that he was part of. Um, that supports people who have mental health concerns and he really was so prolific like through as I was going through all the submissions I kept seeing his work over and over again and he was he would respond to every booklet several times and it was really wonderful to sort of track his progression as well and and he wrote loads of poetry and painted and drew a lot and so I invited him <clears throat> him to make um, some new work for the exhibition which was his first um, commission and exhibition and so he created these six new paintings around the theme of nature he lives in rural Devon and he's very connected like spiritually and to nature and lives on a farm and and yeah speaks of making art and nature like very much of tools um, for managing his mental health um, and then the artist Paloma Proudfoot made the tapestry around his paintings um, because he was comfortable working at a small scale and then we wanted um, the tapestries to, to, to have large presence. So she, she did the sewing. It's, a, it's actually applique of some of the elements of his paintings on top. Um, sorry, I'll try, I'll whip through this. <laughs> so the next slide is the third tapestry around sound and movement. And um, it's an artist, Zoe Cry, that created it. Um, there's lots of connections to many of the booklets. Um, but also she's made this really long poem that runs down the front of it, which is um, an adaptation of several people's poems that were sent in. And it's all really based around this, phys this important um, element of being in your body and being present in your body and how that is linked so much to our own creativity. Um, and then the following slide is, um, we commissioned a lot of doorstep portraits of, of some of the participants that were shown at South Bank Center on these plinths. Um, as well as if you go to the next, I think it's the last slide, they were shown also on um, billboards and um, posters across the country as well. So a, another way to sort of give visibility and voice for this real creative community and um, this wonderful urge within everyone to use creativity as a way to support well-being. Um, and yeah, so now the exhibition and the, the visit those big large plinths with the posters are on tour and it's currently in at Washington Art Center um, right now. And then it will travel to um, Canterbury to the Beanie. And then um, uh, there's a section of the portraits that will be at home in Manchester. And then the last stop on the tour is um, at the De Montfort University in Leicester. And that's the project, sorry, <laughs> quickly, not so quickly. Thanks, Priscilla. Sorry, I was trying to find the mute button there. You'd think <laughs> after all this time, we'd know where these things were. <laughs> so I think um, I've got just a question to start off with. <laughs> and, and, and Priscilla, and just sort of how important um, is making and sharing artwork and knowledge been for you during this pandemic? And there seems to have been throughout all these, these kind of male projects and art projects in the pandemic, like a massive kind of focus on analog tech analog technology and um, analog techniques and methods and you know why do you think that is you know why analog amanda priscilla <laughs> don't you go first amanda sure um yeah, yeah so i think that analog became more important because it was tactile um, I think that was massively lacking. That's what I found was lacking um, during the lockdowns is that people were really desperate to do things that they could with their hands. Um, for me, for my personal practice, I had uh, moved from sculpture to analog. Um, so it felt quite natural going into the male art movement. Um, and obviously that was kind of where my interest lies with like collage and those sorts of things. I think as well, um, why was an emphasis on analog during the lockdown I think is a massive question <laughs> um but I also think that yeah people just needed to do something to take their mind off of um the current circumstance and I really see that overlapping between all three of our projects 
Um, so obviously my work was, it was all very, very small for the restriction show. And the contrast between Kirsten's and Priscilla's work um, is amazing because obviously it's different scales. And I think um, people could just do things they could manage at home. I think that's why analog has a bit of a comeback. And I will pass, I'll throw that back to Priscilla. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I agree. I think there's something really amazing about making with your hands and how how much it's connected to to our own well-being and I know even just in our own my own house like we were doing lots of the drawing projects and even through like homeschooling with my daughter I would just keep embroidering because it was like a way to calm the mind and um just yeah in the same way that I think physical activity and walking it just like lifts those sort of ruminating thought patterns and I think there's nothing like it it's that 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 way to be physically present in your body and, and make something with your hands I think it's yeah we've just I think rediscovered how important it is especially when we're stuck at home and you can only watch so much Netflix um, but I'm I'm quite curious about um, this that both of you um, Kirsty and Amanda this idea that like through your own practice that you've initiated these male art projects and you've brought together all these like amazing people around you. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, yeah, just what it, what it means to you and within your practice to do that and how, how you, if you think you'll carry that on. Um, yeah, I, it's fully my, my kind of intention to keep these things going. I was personally, I was quite, uh, I say overwhelmed, but like overwhelmed in a, a good way with the, the response that I got as I said I think I thought I would get about 20 participants and it would you know it was that that would be fantastic even if it was 20 and um, but the amount of people that kind of um yeah signed up and responded but not only just made the artwork but they spent the time to write a letter and to say what the project meant to them or you know I had participants uh in Sweden and there was someone in the states um who who took the time you know time out of whatever on earth is going on you know in the world um to sit down and write me a letter um and post it out and it's quite uh yeah super touching and it's something yeah I want to keep that going and I'm hoping to just keep building on whatever it is I've started um just continue I think um I don't know if Amanda intends to continue with mail art um, but I'm going to be for sure um Yes, I definitely will be. Uh, the collective is still going, um, which again, like both of your projects, this, the sheer volume of participants, um, I could never have predicted <laughs> at all. Again, I thought I might be like 50 people, not 350 people apply, which was crazy, especially having the outreach to other countries. That was something I never anticipated. Um, and as well for my own practice, um, so very brief background, but I had had an injury. So um, in 2019, it meant I lost my job. So I was already stuck at home before the pandemic happened. So I was very aware of how that felt um, to be isolated and cut off from, from most people that you know. Um, and mail art was a real saving grace. And I feel for a lot of people, especially the people I connected with through restriction, we were all in relatively similar positions. Obviously, we're all for once in our generation experiencing the same thing. We're all stuck in lockdown, which will, has never happened for our generation. So it already was a common ground, which for a lot of disabled people haven't had that um, within their practice or for themselves personally. And that was something I was really keen to pick up on, um, especially within this project um, of restriction. And it was titled restriction, but I tried to remove as many restrictions as possible. So it was just an open call. Um, and, and, you know, apply with what you want, but around the theme. And that's something I want to continue with looking at themes of different things, um, especially politics is of interest of me. I'm not relatively political, but I like the, you know, collage and politics and how collage can um, make change through um, getting posters and prints and DIY making is what I'm interested in. I think both of you guys can uh, relate to that. So yeah, photocopy, you know, hands and faces and god knows what else but let's do it you know <laughs> get it out there um so yeah that's what my personal practice is definitely going to keep making mail art and it's a way to connect with people i think that's something we've mentioned before 
um, I've never been able to connect with people in the States that I am really good friends with and I've never met them in person. And I think that's, um, there's something really special about that is building up these friendships with, with others that um, without me a lot would never have happened. For instance, speaking with both you, Silio and Kirsty, that would never have come out of it, would it? <laughs> no, no, it would not. Um, yeah, I think the the kind of the international reach surprised me a lot as well. I, I don't think I had quite as many international participants as Amanda, but it was still once uh, word gets round or people spot it on Instagram or whatever, I, I found that I got quite a few sign ups that way. Um, and people in Australia and all over the place would message me saying, my family's from our growth. I've not been back in 50 years, but I'm in I'm in Brisbane. Can you send me something out? And connected with the, you know, quite a few people that way. And it's quite nice to, um, I think, yeah, people are just keen to connect with, yeah, with our growth if they left or the kind of roots were there. Um, it's not somewhere that's necessarily ever considered the center of uh, the universe or, you know, the creative world, but it was nice to have that connection and a little bit of our growth going out to all over the place. That's good. For me as a curator, I always, I'm always concerned with like how you can support the long-term <clears throat> um, legacy of, of a community that you form and, and what the what the plan is to to continue to support activity that you've started. Like there's always the excitement around initiating a project and then what happens with that community. And I wondered. Um, for both of you, Christine and Amanda, as artists, like what, how you feel, how, if you feel responsible for that community, or if it does feel very much like everyone is responsible for themselves um, within your, your male art communities you, that you've formed. Will I go first? Or, yeah. Go for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a tricky one. Um, I am keen to keep things going and I have, there are, uh, as I say, I'm going to continue as the Dundee Correspondent School, and I do have, I think all of my participants so far did take part in the our both Correspondent School, so a little part of that will hopefully live on, and I'm going to keep it in the same, you know, the same format. I think I do, yeah, I worry about, well, maybe worry's a bit strong, but um just suddenly these things just stopping because if there's someone who's a really active kind of participant and suddenly these things end I suppose there is a responsibility to check in uh and I'm, yeah I don't know I've not answered that very well actually <laughs> I don't know Amanda you do better than me no no it's good <laughs> um it is really difficult and I think um I think for all of us we've both got this divide between curator's hat and personal practice um, and that's a very fine line <laughs> to um, work between and I know for myself when I was creating the restriction project I was I would use the word worry it would I would worry about people's like uh, well-being and their mental health and were they doing okay I mean um, I know that both of you can relate to this um, as well is that you invested so much more of your personal time into it with phone calls zooms checking in on people making sure they're okay and that was a huge part of keeping up the community and I think that was um, partly my curator's hat on but within within that the community did form um, and I was really fortunate that did happen for the collective and that happened because of social media and digital practices um, and I think if I had just gone purely analog it would have fallen I, wouldn't, I don't want to say form flat but it would have been a lot slower obviously because of the nature of mail art but having you know Instagram and I've you can see these little connections between people commenting on posts and reposting and sharing. And um, a lot of people have come together and done their own projects for, out of the restriction that again, may have never have met in person. And keeping a digital community as well as the analog has been really important for this project. And for myself, because sometimes we know it's like we get inundated with work and you know to physically make something takes a bit of a back burner, but you can still reach out and contact someone via Zoom or, or you know social media of some way. And I guess that really feeds into to some of our practices. But for both of you, do you feel that you need to have digital side with your practice or can you purely be analog and does, does it have its own purpose just being analog? And I'll throw that to... Kirsty first, I think. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I 
when I started there, both correspondence school, I wanted to be entirely analog. I did not want, I just wanted, I kind of wanted the open call on the hospital field website and then that was it. I didn't want to do any kind of digital. Um, I really did want people to just sign up via mail and no other way, but I, I don't really think hospital field would have been very pleased with that <laughs> um, or let me do it. So we, I sort of, we kind of compromised and um, we let sign ups come uh, via the website digitally. So I did get quite a few people who actually wrote requesting to join the project uh, with nice letters and hand, handmade cards and things and it was it was great. Um, I think I eventually did take the leap into getting an Instagram purely as a way of kind of archiving it and just getting it out there because once I realised how much good work was coming in I thought I can't just sit on this purely on my own. I knew it would have been shared at some point but I thought I'll just start uh, getting this shared digitally which I'm not very good at um, but I think it was a nice way of as I say making these connections Amanda would never have found found out about me if I hadn't been on there um, and again all these other connections made um, with people all over the world who signed up just because of the word our growth in there um, it was very very nice to see um, and again I think I said before once you know these kind of mail art um fanatics find out about you you start getting all this amazing unsolicited mail and it all turn up found you on instagram here's a huge bundle of brilliant stuff to look at um which yeah is a great so i think they can coexist um i hope that there are mail art projects or i know that there are mail art projects out there that are purely analog and so much respect to those artists just going on and doing their own thing on the fringes and not not with no desire to be seen necessarily just sharing it amongst themselves and just doing their own thing um there's definitely a place for that maybe one day that'll be me as well cut myself off from the internet that'd be good um Parcelia. yeah i think for me ah oh, it's so tricky i think i mean because my activities around the art by post project was so much about making an exhibition um it was very focused on that physical experience in a space with other people, which is obviously the most wonderful analog <laughs> experience ever. But um, I forgot to mention that we also, because I could only show a certain percentage of the work within the physical exhibition. So ev all of the submissions that were sent in were all scanned and they're all part of an online gallery. So it's, it's really interesting to think about like, some participants of the project were only on, um, you could only contact them on the telephone or through the post and some really preferred email and some, so it's just, it was really thinking about how different ways of communicating and, in, and ways of including people um, differed in terms of digital or analog ways. But I think ultimately I am very invested in the physical, experience of seeing artwork really like seeing a scan of a and of an image of something that someone made looked so different than seeing the actual piece of paper and I think that's part of the conditions of mail art is that it travels through time and space in an envelope and a lot of people just put them in their envelopes really quickly and didn't, or folded it in several ways and chucked it in the post and didn't think about it as an artwork so much because for them maybe they don't consider themselves artists so that was that quality that physical quality was so beautiful of like it has an artifact of that journey that it's taken and all of the bent corners and the folds and the I don't know like crumbs that tons of them had like coffee stains and it just like it comes everything was made within the home and you can see that and different pens and different um pieces of scrap paper and like shopping lists on the back and I think it, that in itself becomes a really wonderful documentation of our time at home as well um and yeah we've talked a little bit about this but I'm curious for the both of you because these mail art projects have all and not ended but like culminated in an exhibition and how that making public of these like in quite intimate and private exchanges is an important part of your practice as well um do you want to go first, Amanda? Sure. Um, yeah, it's it's quite funny that all of our projects are mail art projects, um, and yet we've always exhibited them in an institution. And um, yeah, the irony, my 
goodness. <laughs> um, and yeah, for me personally, it was really, really beneficial to use an organisation. Um, it meant I had a further outreach to showcase people that, like Cecilia just said, that wouldn't normally take part in an arts-based project. And that was really, really vital to showcasing the work. Um, I purposely didn't use include anyone's name or um, if they're like emerging disabled or professional within the images um, like the ones you saw in my introduction and the reason I did that was because I didn't want people to get attached to the labels um, of you know what artists generally do like you know you go to an exhibition there's an there's the name the work what have you and I didn't I wanted to just experiment and see would it work if I took that out um, how would the work be viewed and obviously, how would it be viewed online? Um, that was also another thing. Um, obviously, you have the crucial part, which is the physical work. And that was massively important because I wanted people to be able to make stuff at home and send it in. And I think for the community, that was really um, important as well that took part. And then have it go to an establishment as well. I think it validated um, for a lot of the people taking part that it went somewhere and it was doing something because we all know what it's like making lots of work and it sits at home and you see it like three years later you know <laughs> um, and I think for a lot of people during the pandemic um, especially that that was really crucial um, and I wanted to ask Priscilla that obviously your project really focused on well-being and stuff and how did you think that impacted being within an institution for you? Not sure I quite understood the question. For maybe Gika, did you say it one more time? Um, yeah. So your project had a lot to do around well-being um, and like people's well-being, and um, obviously they made work for out of the project packs you had that was had a heavy focus. How do you think people felt knowing that, that was going to be part of an exhibition? I apologise, I worded that mm -hmm. terribly. No, <laughs> I think um, yeah. I, I mean, it was so many different people like with over 4,000 people. So it, it's hard to generalize. I think um, definitely some people just sent it in thinking it wouldn't be part of the exhibition at all. And then it ended up in the exhibition and that had quite a massive impact on how they viewed what they did. And, and I think we talked about this a little bit before, but how you could see people grow in confidence from the beginning of the project to the end and how certain um reframing of what people was were making through the projects gave them the confidence to then call themselves an artist because they realized that they were doing things similar to maybe what what an artist was doing in a booklet that was sent to them so it was also about that um yeah the inspiration that was led by the artist through the project that that i think gave a lot of confidence and gave some um yeah, more weight to what people were making, but I think it was a huge, um, ex like vast different types of experience from different people. But I think those the envelopes that were sent, like the actual activity books were sent in bright yellow envelopes. And I think there was something that about these yellow envelopes turning up every month that even that was like a really exciting moment to, to receive. And that like regularity and that constant knowledge that there was this community attached to these envelopes that you were part of something beyond yourself as well. I think that had a really large um, impact in just people not feeling alone. Um, that's right, Kirsty, did, did you want to respond as well? Um, yeah, I'm not, yeah. Um, yeah, I think showing it kind of publicly um, just kind of as you were saying, just validates the the kind of experience and the time and the, the effort that, that people had put into it. I had quite a few, I'm not an artist responding. I mean, everyone everyone's an artist and everyone who's taken part is an artist. But again, I think we spoke about it before, seeing people's kind of confidence growing. The, the first response you would get would be a, oh, I hope this is okay. I don't know if I've done this right. And then, you know, the next month that person sends you two pieces of mail and then it's three pieces of mail and then you can really see the kind of uh, as I say like the confidence growing and the kind of interaction and the, the the excitement and the work that they're doing um and that I just it just had to be shown off I think and validated all this this hard work and I think like Amanda was saying you know you make a piece of work sometimes and it goes into a 
box or a folder and you don't see, you don't see it again for three years and you're like oh I made that so I think it's yeah to get this shown and recorded and documented and sent out to the participants to say look what because the exhibition that I've put together at Hospital Field wouldn't exist without the participants the, the mail art project is not me it's the you know it's not me it's not Amanda it's not it's it's the participants that that make it it wouldn't exist without them so we need to to celebrate that and show that off I think Yeah. Do we need to get any more questions? Um, so what do you think would happen if we hadn't have shown our exhibitions in a gallery? Could the mail art itself just purely exist on its own? And I open that up to either one of you. Um, yeah, I mean, it does, obviously, yeah. See, I'm starting to talk now without thinking this through. Priscilla, maybe you could <laughs> you could do it instead of me. <laughs> oh, I think as humans, we like we love celebrations, and I think again, I'll say the same thing. But I think exhibitions are so wonderful for that, for like stopping and appreciating. And and I think for me, the South Bank exhibition was in September, which was in a point where we were relatively. Um, there was relatively less cases of COVID and it felt like, okay, this is a wonderful moment to come together and celebrate together all of the, the things that this community has made. And I think, yeah, there's something so wonderful about stopping and celebrating and, and making that public. And I think, I don't know, I'd be curious if a mail art, I'm sure there's many of them that have never made public any, any part of it. And, how that affects its longevity and its um yeah the, the commitment rate and yeah it would be really interesting to know but i just i love exhibitions so <laughs> i can <laughs> what do you think Kirsty? um yeah i don't really have anything else to add to that to be honest but you both be so uh, articulate and sort of expressing what i want to yeah i feel the same <laughs> not much to add yeah, I just um, wanted to add there is that um, how do both of you find mail art projects? Because I know now, like before in like probably 50 mm -hmm. to 1950s to 1975, give or take, it was printed in a newspaper. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know anyone that buys a newspaper these days. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, how do you go about finding mail art projects? Because I know mine is purely Instagram, uh, predominantly Instagram, rather, should I say, um, or like Facebook or, or something like that. Um, yeah, how do you stay connected within the mail art world? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I've found a lot for someone who's kind of not into using Instagram for these things. I found most of them through Instagram recently. I do, there's something about mail art projects when you try and Google them and find them. They're on websites and blogs that the technology, the, the, yeah, the technology is quite antiquated. I think that's been used, which I am a big fan of, actually. The, the sort of, it makes me think of, you know, someone doing a mail art project in 2002 thinking, we need a website. Everyone's got a website now and they've done it and they've never bothered to properly update it other than, you know, the basic information. I quite like finding websites like that. Um, and the International Mail Union of Mail Artists or Mail Artists Union website is very much like that. And I'm, I'm quite a fan of it. Um, it's a little bit of a throwback, which, which I like. But again, yeah, mostly find out about Instagram for all I'm on about it. It's like, oh, there's one, there's another one, there's another one, and get involved with them all. Um, it's just the nature of the thing, I suppose. Um, I don't know, Priscilla, if you find about, about these things the same way, or if you have a, an ongoing interest in mail art, if it's something you would like to curate again or organise another project. Yeah, I definitely am invested in this idea of reaching people through post. Um, I don't have much to add about how I find the projects, but what it, the one thing that I really enjoy about mail art projects is uh, is their names, and because there's so many different and really similar names, and all the different puns on post and courier, and just like the method of travel, and specifically around this time, there's been a, around around COVID, there's been a lot more mail art projects that have started and. And I think, yeah, the, the titling of them is really interesting to me, um, especially in America, too, with the, the connection with the, the postal voting system and the, the power of the post for art. And I think there was lots of interesting yeah, couriers of hope <laughs> was one of my favorites. Um, yeah, I think 
it is a really interesting medium, definitely. Um, but I am aware that we're almost at, at three and I feel like we should maybe open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you so much. I've got a few things that have come in and I'm wondering if actually, um, Louisa, do you feel like your question's been answered already about social media and everything? Is Louisa Louisa. Still still yeah, I'm quite happy. That's been yeah. great, really good, thank you. Well, we've got some nice comments and then if anyone wants to ask, I'll just read through the comments. Um, so Jennifer was saying, I was making art a good while before the pandemic and with the explosion of social media posting of art of all sorts, my male art interests have definitely changed. I still do some call outs. I like a certain amount of A and P's, but not too many. I'm not sure what A and P's are. Um, it's the one-to-one -one exchange. Pass. What is it, sorry? It's an add and pass. So it goes to one person, you add to it and it goes to someone else. <laughs> there you go, terminology. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the one-to-one -one exchanges that I'm not sure, uh, not now, not sure what for me. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and then when you were talking, Rita commented to say, I think the ongoing correspondence between us through art was so enjoyable, even without the prospect of an exhibition. So that's like hearing from the participants, which is quite nice to see how they feel about the exhibitions. And Hazel also commented to say, I suppose it's a disparate scattered creation that is wonderful to have it contained all in one place altogether, either in an exhibition or a book. So we bring it together. Does anyone want to ask any questions directly through video? or the chat. I think Hazel's comment is lovely too. This idea of a publication is such a nice way of, of archiving mail art projects as well. Um, I'm thinking a lot about that right now because I'm doing a small section of the Art by Post project for the South Bank archive. And we're thinking a lot about how how the terms around each artwork is catalogued and, and how those terms can be generated and how how a project that's so brought together by numerous people can be archived and all of their experiences and how it can be a bit user informed and I think that that would be an interesting way to think about it in a publication as well. Yeah just picking up on archiving um, it is really interesting because obviously for the restriction project, it could just be overlooked in this piece of furniture. You shut the drawer, the drawers and you can just walk straight past it, which I really love. And I think mail art as a movement has, has that element to it. You can just walk straight past it and not engage, or you can do as much as most, as both of us know. There's some really heavy participants uh, that you know do lots of things for us, which is lovely. And um, so for archiving for me, and again, it brings up working with the institution. Um, so it's been massively helpful working with Clayhill Arts because it's their piece of furniture and it can stay within the organization um, and be used and shown for different things, especially to mark the time that the exhibition was on, which was joined uh, early this year of March with, with the lockdown. And, and yeah, I think that was, it's really, again, it's really helped contribute to an added element of the mail art. It sort of brought another thing to it. So. Um, Kirsty, are you, how are you going to archive your project as your exhibition is on now? Get down there, guys. <laughs> um, well, actually, there is actually a publication for it, which, uh, in predictable style, is also lost in the postal system. Uh, it's been dispatched, but the tracking's not working, so I'm going to have to chase that up. So it didn't arrive in time for the exhibition, unfortunately. But there is a publication, and I thought that's... I mean, I'm never going to archive it digitally. Well, it's, it is all scanned, but I'm, it's, you know, it's never going to have its own website or anything like that, I don't think. So I think putting it together in a book and a little concise publication that you can hold in your hand is a really uh, important kind of tactile way that, yeah, we can just hold on to it. And it's, I like the idea of all this work that's, you know, masses of work spread out and I've got it in a little A6 postcard size, little, little fat chunky book. Yeah, um, yeah. It's good. And um, when they arrive, I will let you know all know when I track them down somewhere in the UK postal system. Kirsty, will your first uh, iteration of the Dundee Correspondence School, the renamed version, will it use the Arbroath stamps? Is that or what are you what will you use those stamps for? Well, the stamps were just kind of they're just they were sort of designed just to be like an addition, almost like a print. So the participants who who did contribute to it will be get they will receive them when they arrive and they'll go back out. But I've got a little bunch of extra ones that I will be adding hopefully to future mail art projects. I think it would be a waste just to 
you know, they're intended, they're intended as prints, but if they're used even better, um, and we can send James Chalmers all over the place with his little stamp <laughs> that faces on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant. Was there anything else from anyone, um, any questions or anything anyone wants to ask before we say our thank yous? Yeah. Oh, Louise, are you? Probably easier just to ask it. Um, may I ask how you funded these, these mail art projects? Or is that a bit personal? Uh, no, not to, I mean, I was, I was, it was a paid residency. So I was on artist, I was artist in residence at Hospital Field and Hospital Field uh, had funding for that whole project through the Robertson Trust um, and maybe, maybe some others, Kirsten's better versed than that. But um, so I, my time was paid for, the materials were kind of mostly paid for. Um, and that's how, that's how I was funded. The, I tried to keep kind of cost minimal for participants. Everything went out and it could be returned with a second class stamp, just a single second class stamp. I didn't want to send anything too big or very, very costly or, you know, parcels, anything like that. And if we did receive some larger work back, that was kind of on the, on the participants end. I tried to keep it as affordable as possible for everyone. Um, I don't know about Amanda in that respect. Um, yeah, so for the restriction project, um, I was really lucky to get Arts Council funding, um, so that paid for the venue and the venue's time um, and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, again, tried to keep it as minimal uh, sort of costing as possible. But yeah, I was really lucky to get Arts Council funding for that. Um, but my mail art for myself personally, I self-fund. Um, yeah, I, I pay for the postage myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. How did uh, the South Bank? Um, yeah, it, it was funded um, in a lot of ways. So there was a whole host of partners. There was referral partners um, to get the word out to, to more people to join. And then there was delivery partners. Um, and then the National Academy of Social Prescribing um, was one of the major funders because they, they worked with a huge group of link workers and um, uh, social prescribers to refer people on to um, the project. People can self-refer themselves, but they also, to, in order to get the, the word out and the reach out, worked really closely with NASP, um, who also funded it. But they also had Arts Council funding and Paul Hamlin funding, and they had a huge host. Um, of diff and then South Bank itself um, was, fun was fundraising for it through um, their, their fundraising team. So yeah, it, it, was, it was a big project, but NASP specifically fund are funding the the online gallery and the physical exhibition and the tour, that's really important for, for what they're doing. And there's lots of signposting for each specific venue to how people can get involved locally in projects like this. So there's a big, um, yeah, well-being focus for the whole project. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I've just put my email in the chat to say that if you were interested to know more about any of the projects or want to be signed up or your details passed on to either Priscilla, Kirsty or Amanda, um, then you can do that. But I realise I've just put a typo in my email. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Too much, sorry. Um, so you can contact me and I put forward your details on if you're interested in signing up or if you want to publications or stamps or anything like that. Um, okay, is there anything else? I'll just round off I think now it's five past three um, thank you so much Amanda, Priscilla and Kirsty um, and it's been wonderful hearing from you and thank you so much to all of you that came along to listen in and I will um, have this recording available for those of you that to share or listen again or if you want to um, direct anyone towards the website but thank you so much again it was really nice really really great Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Lovely. Yeah, thanks for taking time out of your Saturday to, to be with us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's really lovely to see everyone. And yeah, special thanks to being invited for this. It's been wonderful. Yeah, and thanks to Amanda for inviting me to collaborate. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs>